For the past three weeks, we have been in Judges 13, 14, and 15, which is three-fourths of the life of Samson, one of the major judges that we see in the book of Judges, hence why it's called Judges. There's a lot of judges in the book, and Samson being one of the most well-known, I think many of us know uh, chapter 16 more than we know 13, 14, and 15, because chapter 16 is where you know, Delilah comes in the scene, cuts his hair, you know, loses his strength, his eyes are gouged out, and, and uh, kills a bunch of Philistines. Um, but a lot happens in 13, 14, and 15. And as we've been studying through the book and through Samson's life, Samson is a very interesting character because, one, you do see him in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith, right? Um, obviously, he has been called by God to lead his people as a judge. But as you read through 13, 14, 15, and 16, you're kind of like, how did he make it into Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of faith? How and why did God even call him to lead? And it's interesting because you look in chapter 13, he was called before he was even born, right? And yet here you look at his life and it's like, it's just like utter failure after failure after failure, sin after sin after sin. And I'm like, where's the good stuff, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, you know, you look at that, and it's, it's a little bit confusing, but it's also, I guess, somewhat encouraging. Not that I want to read myself into the text, because I really want to see what the text is, is for in regards to Jesus, especially when it comes to the Old Testament. But I do see that, you know, he's, he's a man, right? And you look at every man or woman in, in Hebrews chapter 11 who's considered, you know, a man of God, a man of faith. I mean, they were all pretty, you know, they were sinners, right? They failed. You know, we, we look at David, right? David's a prime example. He's, you know, he's got this uh, nickname, or I don't know what you want to call it, a man after God's own heart, right? Well, I mean, if you look at his life, you know, he was adulterer, a murderer, you know, a couple other things, a liar, uh, lazy, you know, wasn't doing what the kings were supposed to be doing. But yet, God saw him in Scripture as a man after his own heart, you know? So it's encouraging because all of us in here are... <laughs> just as bad as David and Samson, right? <laughs> but God has, has chosen us, and he is a gracious and loving God. And that is one of the things that you see that is common throughout Samson's life, is just seeing the grace of God. But also what you see is someone who is a type of Jesus, a, a shadow, a picture of Jesus to come. Now, anytime that there is a type or a shadow or a picture of Jesus to come, because this is the Old Testament before Jesus came on the scene as a man, we see that those types are not always perfect, right? It's always, it always, le- it's always lacking. It always leaves you wanting something better. And I think that's the point, because then it, it really then gets you to, to wanting something, or more importantly, someone better. And obviously, we know that Jesus has come and he has done that. Now, as New Testament believers, we can look back, right, like we just did with communion, we can look back and see that Jesus has fulfilled this. Jesus is the perfect Savior. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the perfect example, other, you know, unlike all the other ones we see in the Old Testament. And so Judges is full of Judges. I'm in Joshua. I'm in the wrong book. Full of Judges. There's 12 Judges that we see in the book of Judges, and then you see two more afterwards. Um, so there's 14 in total. But Samson is the last judge that we see come on the scene here in Judges chapter 16. But really quick, I want to look. I think I have it on the screen. Judges chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. This is after Joshua has, has passed you know, the torch and the, or the baton, and uh, he's passed away. What we see is that Israel then you know, spirals, and they start to sin. They start to do things that's right in their own eyes. Um, and... God has to constantly deliver them, right? Because they have this roller coaster effect. And we've seen this as we studied through Judges through these first 15 chapters, that it's constantly, it's like like a fourfold effect. You've got, um, they, they walk away from the Lord, right? They do what is right in their own eyes. They start to sin. Well, then God gives them over to their, their flesh and their lusts. And then eventually they become, you know, oppressed by another people, uh, they go through a certain amount of time being oppressed to the point where it gets so bad that they finally recognize their sin and they finally cry out to God. God hears their cries and what does God do because he's faithful? He saves them, right? He either sends a judge or 
somebody to deliver them. And Samson is one of those who is going to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. But again, the Israelites, they deserve this. They deserve to be oppressed. They deserve to be under the, the, the hands of the Philistines because of their sin, because of their turning away from God. And sometimes it's, it's a good thing that God allows us to be handed over to that because we need to hit rock bottom so that we can actually turn to him. Right? And there's an interesting chapter. I actually don't remember where it is. Um, oh, actually, chapter 10, if you want to turn there really quick. This is with, um, I can't remember what, what judge this is. It says in verse 10 that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. So they, they recognize their, their sin in the sight of a holy God. So the Lord responds to them in verse 11. He says, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the people of Ammon, and from the Philistines? It's like God's like... I've been faithful for so long. How do you not recognize this? Also, the Sidonians, the Malachites, the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. He says this. This is interesting. This is like the one and only time I've ever seen this. He says, therefore, I will deliver you no more. He says, go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen and let them deliver you in your time of distress. Right? You, you've chosen these gods to serve these gods who you think have some type of power and ability, well, go ask them to free you. Obviously, we know, and they recognize that they cannot do that. So they respond again in verse 15, and they say, we have sinned. And this is interesting, because now they've gotten to a place of brokenness and a contrite spirit and a, and a, and a contrite heart. He said, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. They get to a point where it's not, you know, this is what we want. Well, rather, Lord, we, we have no say in this because we know we've messed up. You do whatever seems right. If you want to deliver us, great. If you don't want to deliver us, that's not great, but we understand. We can't, we can't question that. It says in verse 16 that they put away their foreign gods from among them and serve the Lord. And so not only did they cry out, you know, just with their words, but then they proved it in their actions, right? They got rid of the things, the, the idols and all the idolatry, and it says in verse 16, it says, speaking of God, his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. And you see God, like, in a sense, like, getting emotional, like, because he, he loves and he cares for his people, right? We see Jesus in the same way where he was compassionate towards, you know, the lost sheep of Israel because they had no shepherd. Like, like God couldn't stand it because he loves us so much, right? It's, it's, I think parents, you understand this. Right? Like when we discipline our kids, we always say, well, it hurts me more than it hurts you. Right? In a sense, that, that's true because we, we love and, and care for them so much, it's hard to see them in pain or in hurt or in misery, even if that's what they deserve and that's their consequence. So it says the soul can no longer endure the misery of Israel. And so God, obviously, because he's faithful, he does eventually deliver them. But getting into, oh, Judges chapter 2, we didn't even read it. Judges chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. I want to read this to you. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked, and obeying the commandments of the Lord, they did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and deliver them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harass them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And so as you look at judges, it's, it's going to be a picture of Jesus to come, but it also just shows the long suffering and the mercy and the grace that God has for his people because it's constant of turning away from the one true living God. And it's not like they didn't know, right? I mean, Israel saw God do things. They heard him speak. You know, like they have all this mounting evidence of God and him and being faithful and being almighty and powerful. And they also have this mounting evidence of all the other gods being absolutely nothing. And yet, in their flesh, they decide to serve these other gods, and God is just constantly merciful to them. 
And so he brings judges to deliver them. And that is kind of what the, the role of the judge was. It's not how we would think in, you know, our society where, you know, you go to the courthouse in Johnson County and you stand before the judge and, you know, they either decide if you're guilty or not. Um, the judge, the Hebrew title means deliverer or savior. It was one that was a leader. And you'll see this with all the judges that you read with these 12 judges. The one that you don't see as being a leader in, per se is Samson because he is the only judge that does everything absolutely alone. <laughs> and I don't think any good leader does things alone, right? But he does deliver, okay? He does, in a sense, he is a savior in a sense, okay? I'm not equating him to Jesus as Lord and Savior, but Savior as in the term. And so what you see through these 12 judges, each one is flawed, each one is limited in what they could accomplish. In the whole book, as you read through the whole book, it leaves us longing for something more or like I said earlier, someone more, someone greater. And obviously we know that to be Jesus Christ, who is the final true judge. So the four-part sequence that we see happening over and over and over again, like I said earlier, is Israel departs from God. They do what's right in their own eyes. God punishes them. They get what they deserve, right? Because he's a righteous, literal judge. They come under subjugation of another people or nation, then it becomes so bad after a period of time, this is the third part, after a period of time that they pray to God for deliverance, they cry out to God. And the fourth part is that God raises up a judge to lead them and deliver them from their oppressors. And then they have peace in the land for a certain amount of years and then we start back at square one, right? And this happens over and over and over again. So 12 judges, the other two that we see later on are Eli and Samuel coming to 14. We know that God is the higher judge, the greater judge, the, the only judge. Judges here, the book spans about 350 years after Joshua's conquests until we get to Israel's monarchy with the first king of Saul. And again, Samson is the last judge that we see here. I'm trying to give you a little background before we get into this because I haven't been able to take you chapter by chapter. So it's a little bit harder. But again, 13, 14, 15, and 16, these four chapters, you see the life of Samson. And like I said, he is very, very interesting to read. If you haven't read 13, 14, and 15, we'll kind of do it tonight, but I would encourage you to do it on your own time just to get an understanding because a lot of us know chapter 16 but may have not read 13, 14, and 15. So we see a lot of lows, we see a lot of sin, uh, but even in the midst of that, we see God using all those lows and failures and sin for his good, for his purpose. Because despite our failures, like we don't ruin God's plan. Right? Because otherwise, like, I would be then greater than God because I can ruin his plans. But no, God is sovereign and he's purposeful that he wants to use us, right, as co-laborers, but he can use us in spite of us sometimes, you know, and he can use the bad for our good and most importantly for his good, right? Um, I was encouraging and letting the, the youth know just one example, like with Hitler, I think we would all agree that what Hitler did and who Hitler was was a bad person, right? And, and all the things that happened were not very good. I think I told you guys last time I was up here that when we, our team went to Europe in August, we actually visited Auschwitz. And that was a, a, like, it was just crazy to see all the things. I mean, obviously you can look at it online and watch videos, but to be there in that presence, it was nuts. So we understand how bad that was, right? With, with the Jews and what Hitler and the Germans did. But even God used that for his purpose. Right? And if you didn't know this, Israel wasn't a nation before that, right? But after that, because of that, because of, I want to say publicity, I, wanna, I, wanna, I, don't, I can't think of a better word, but because it was so widespread and world known that because all that led to them becoming a nation, right? And we see how important it is that Israel becomes a nation again. And that has never happened in history for a country to become a nation once again, right? So even something as crazy as that, God uses for his good. And we're going to see with Samson, all his craziness, his mess, his failures, his sin, his pride, God uses for his good. And now that's not to say, and it's not to encourage us that, well, let's start doing bad because God can use it for good anyways. <laughs> well, no, because what you end up seeing is that at the end of Samson's life, I mean, he's utterly alone. I mean, he's, he's hurt, he's broken, he's had to face every consequence because of his sin and because of his failures, but it hasn't messed up God's plan. Right, and that's the one, that, I mean, that's encouraging for us because when we do fail 
it's encouraging to know that I haven't messed up God's plan, right? I, I need to repent and turn from my sin and God can restore me, but knowing that I, I'm not so great that I've messed up God's plan. So he makes it into Hebrews chapter 11. Um, obviously we see because he's in Hebrews chapter 11 that he had faith, right? And I think that's the greatest thing that we can display is faith. It's the one thing needed for our salvation, correct? Like there's, there's one condition and that's faith. Now it's a faith in Jesus Christ for the work that he's done, right? It's a, it's a simple trust. I don't want to say simple, I don't think, but it's a trust in Jesus Christ for dying on the cross, knowing that we're sinners and that he rose again and defeated death and sin. So, Samson's a failure, he sins, we're no different than him, he needs a lot of grace, we need a lot of grace, right? This isn't to justify sin, uh, it's not an encouragement to be disobedient, knowing that we will receive sin or that God will use it for good. Again, Samson's life shows us one important thing, and that's Jesus. That Jesus is better, that Jesus is the perfect judge, that Jesus is the perfect and complete savior, because Jesus, Samson is an incomplete savior. And we're going to see that in chapter 13 or 14, I can't remember, where God says he will begin to deliver Israel. Whereas Jesus completes and delivers us perfectly and completely. Samson was strong. We all know that, right? He was also very, very smart. He wasn't just this strong guy that was dumb, you know, kind of like we see with like cartoons and stuff like that. No, like he was actually like really smart and really strong, but he also had faults and inabilities. Um, Yeah, so let's look, chapter 13, really quick, verse one. I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. So just like we talked about the ups and downs with Israel, we see it already starting in verse one. It says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them, again, we see God does this, it's their consequence, into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years, for 40 years. And so in this chapter, we're going to see the birth of Samson, the beginning of Samson, and it's, it's awesome, it's great. Like, this is like one of the best chapters in the life of Samson, and it's mainly due to his parents. Because even in the midst of verse 1, where we see that all of Israel, in a sense, has done evil in the sight of the Lord, we see one couple that is doing what is right, right? And God is going to use this couple for his purpose. And so in verse 3, because I'm really trying to get to chapter 15, so I'm going to skip 13 and 14 a little bit. In verse 3, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a child. And so we see here an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Right? We know that, that the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has always been and will always will be. But sometimes we forget that they have been prior to the New Testament, especially the Holy Spirit, and especially, more especially, Jesus. Right? But you look in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. Well, I was about to quote John 1-1. Uh, now I forgot Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They're so similar. Right? And the word God is Elohim, meaning more than two. Right? And then we see, well, let us make man in our own image, speaking of the triune God. And so God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been. So Jesus comes. We call this some uh, a pre-incarnate theophany, an appearance of God in the Old Testament before Jesus again took human flesh or before he was born unto the Virgin Mary. And so we see a foreshadowing as well here with this birth of Samson. So it's, it's very similar in how, you know, the angel Lord appeared to this woman, she's not given a name, so Samson's mom, as well as appearing to Mary. You guys remember this? It's very, very similar. So look really quick in verse five. It says, for behold, this is the angel of the Lord, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver, no, I jumped to verse what am I looking for? Um, I can't remember where it is. Well, let's just read it anyways. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand 
of the Philistines. I'll come back to my point earlier. But here we see that the angel of the Lord is, is telling Samson's mom that he is going to be a Nazarite. And a Nazarite was, it was typically a vow, and it was something that was done of your own accord, right? Like, you chose to do it. You weren't forced to do it. And here there's a big difference with Samson where he's actually forced to do this, and it's not for a certain period of time. It's actually for the entirety of his life. And so what we see here is that the angel of the Lord says at the end of this, the verse, he says, he shall begin to deliver Israel. Like I said earlier, Samson is an incomplete savior, right? He is only going to begin what, what Jesus will finish and complete because he is the complete savior. So again, Samson is a picture or a type of Jesus to come. But again, we see the same announcement to the mother as we see with Mary um, that you'll conceive and bear a son. He'll lead God's people. There's a lot of similarities that we see in the midst of this. And so, again, he takes the Nazarite vow, and so does his mom to this point of where she has to give birth. And this is what the Nazarite vow entails. In Numbers chapter 6, verses 2 through 8, it's on the screen. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister, when they die because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. I don't have a lot of time to break that down, but essentially a Nazarite was a person who was, who was dedicated himself to God. We see like the word separation a lot, right? you're separating yourself unto the Lord, right? And, and I think, you know, for us as New Testament Christians, we're even called to this, to, to be sanctified, to be separate from the world, to be different, right? To not be conformed or to be set apart. And so the point of the Nazarite vow was to look different and to act different, right? To look different and to act different than everyone around you. And it's not because they were better than others, but because they were wholly devoted to God. And that's what it looks like. When you're completely devoted to God, and you completely surrender him, you're going to look completely different, and you're going to act completely different than the rest of the world, right? Now, hopefully, as all of us would be considered Christians and born again, that we would all, in a sense, look the same, because we would all be devoted to God. So doing this shows that God is your pleasure, your pursuit, and your purpose. Then you jump to verse 18. It says, the angel of the Lord said to him, speaking of the husband, Samson's father, he said, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So some things had transpired. The angel of the Lord continued to appear to the woman and not the man. And he says, well, why do you ask my name? He says, seeing it is wonderful. And so here's another hint at who this person is, speaking of Jesus. You look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which is also on the screen. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called, the first one is wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this is, again, another hint that this is Jesus. Jump to verse 19, it says, so Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the Lord, because they asked him if they could provide a, they, they wanted to feed him, but he said no. He said, you can provide an, an offering. And so they offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked up. In verse 20, as it happened, it happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we've just seen God, Right? And I think this, this might be an understanding of what God said to Moses, right? But also, like, just this, this fear, this respect, this reverence for knowing that I, an unholy man, has just been in the presence 
of a holy, perfect, and just God, right? That this is the God of the universe, like how did he not strike me down? And so the two things and the two questions that I, I, I come and ask of this and seeing this situation with Manoah and even his wife's response is, one, it, like am I going to respond this way? Because my question is, do we truly know who God is? Because I think if we know who God is, then we have a similar response, right? And I think consequently, if we know who God is, then we can answer the second question is, do we truly know how bad our sin is? Because as I look at how, God, how good God is, I really then begin to see how bad I am, right? Because sometimes we, we really justify our sin. We think it's not that bad, right? We, we just consider sin to be like, oh, like an oopsie <laughs> or like a mistake, you know? And I guess you can somewhat define it like that, but I think it's more hideous and abominable and more extensive than we try to allow our own hearts to recognize. And I think our hearts, you know, because sometimes they can be deceitful, um, we don't want to believe it. But again, as we, as we look and see who God is, because that's what the whole point of the Bible is, right? It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. But at the same time, it's beneficial to us. So as I'm looking at God, it's also beneficial to me understanding and seeing like, woe is me, right? A man of unclean lips, and yet God still loves me. I see the grace of God. I see the forgiveness of God. I see the long-suffering of God. And so a wonderful reaction uh, from Manoah, and the same for his wife. His wife. He sa- she says this in verse 23, because he's like, well, we should have died. And she says, calm down. They're both right. She says, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands. Three, she, give, he, she gives him three you know, points. Nor would he have shown us these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. So how are they able to stand before the Lord and not die, as God had said to Moses? Oh, I think part of it is the veiling that that God provides. But I think part of it, too, that we see specifically with this example is we see God's grace, right? We see God's grace, an example of God's grace to come, you know, for us as New Testament Christians, that God accepted the burnt offering for sin, right? And there we see Jesus, the angel of the Lord, ascend in the flame of the altar. So there's a sacrifice, there's an atonement, and it was accepted. The same exact way that we see Jesus, when he dies upon the cross, he rises from the grave, but what does he do after he makes his appearance to the 500 witnesses? He does the same thing that we see here. He ascends back up to heaven, signifying that he, the sacrificial lamb, was accepted by God, right? That he could then be in heaven. So this gives us hope, right? Because here's grace that we, because that's what God wants to do. He wants to reconcile us and bring us back to him. So we have this grace and this hope to be reconciled back to God. So chapter 14, we've got 17 minutes. Now Samson went down to Timnah in verse one and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines So he went up and he told his father and mother, saying, we had an interesting discussion with the kids with this one. I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, go get her for me as as a wife. And we talked about how, like, that's not how you do things, right? (laughs) Plus, mom and dad would be like, what are you talking about? Like, (laughs) go talk to him first or her, whatever. (laughs) Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brother? Remember, these were godly parents in the midst of a time where Israel was ungodly. And, and they respect the command of God to not intermarry, right? And it's not a, you know, God's like against interracial or different nations or people or types of people. It, it's an interfaith type thing that God doesn't want us to intermingle with, right, when it comes to marriage. Because he says, well, don't be unequally yoked. And the unequally yoked has to do with our faith. Who do we trust? Who do we believe? Right? So you're either born again or you're not. There's only two types of people. You're either dead or you're alive. You're born again or you're not. You're saved or you're not. Right? And so we see that as a born again Christian, you're to be completely and utterly devoted to God. Someone who's not, it's the complete opposite. So how could you ever mesh and be together? Right? Now, God is a God of miracles and can do amazing things. And, and obviously, the other one can be born again. But before we say the I do's, don't do that. 
right? Because there might be, obviously, instances where you both go into it unbelieving, then one becomes uh, born again and the other isn't. But there's a whole thing with that. I don't have time with that. But we just see the, the, the mistakes that Samson starts to make right here in verse 1. This is the beginning of Samson's life that we see. He's an older man. Well, I won't say he's an older man, but he's, he's old enough to get married, right? He sees a woman. She's pretty. I want to marry her, right? I don't even want to talk to her. I just want to, like, send her a Snapchat, and hopefully she'll start dating me, right? Like, <laughs> kids these days don't really talk to each other anymore. Well, it was the same thing back then, right? <laughs> Doesn't want to talk to her. Asks his father and mother to go get her, to marry her. And they, again, they encourage, well, why, why can't you find a woman amongst our people? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not a, a racial or nation thing. It's a, it's a faith thing. He says, why would you go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? So Samson says to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Literally meaning she's right in my eyes. Right? And again, this is where we see the mistake of Samson, where, like we see with all Israel, they do what's right in their own eyes. Samson's doing what is right in his own eyes. And so he's falling to the temptation of the lust of the eyes to appease the lust of the flesh because he struggles with the pride of life, right? And so in verse 4, it says, His father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. This is where we talked about earlier, how God uses his sin, his failures, his mistakes to even accomplish what God's original purpose was, which is to deliver Israel from the Philistines and to judge the Philistines. It says at the end of verse 4 that God was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So again, he's using this bad for his good. He has a purpose and he is sovereign. We can't, we can't mess that up. Verse 17, at, well, I'm skipping so much. Um, what ends up happening is, uh, let's see. So in verse 5, it says, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, obviously, he probably shouldn't have, that probably wasn't sin per se, but he probably shouldn't have put himself in a position to be tempted by sin because remember, he had the Nazarite vow. He wasn't to touch anything that came from vine. So why, why walk past it, right? That's just putting yourself in a, in a place to fall and to fail. It says, now to a surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him, mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one of torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Now, obviously, if one of your kids had done that, you would know immediately because that's the most amazing thing they probably ever accomplished. <laughs> uh, but the, he's hiding the fact that he touched something that was dead, right? Again, what he was not supposed to do, taking the Nazarite vow. So he went down, he talked with the woman. She pleased Samson well. It says, after some time when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. He goes and he actually eats of it, and then he brings some of that honey to his father and mother, and again, he doesn't tell them where he got it from, right? So again, to, to get to that honey, he's probably having to touch the dead carcass, which he's not supposed to do. And again, we see that he's lying to his parents because he's not being forthcoming. So after that happens, they, they set up this, this wedding feast with Samson and this woman uh, who's unnamed. And uh, Samson, because he struggles with pride, comes up with this riddle with the 30 companions. I'm going so fast, I'm so sorry with these 30 companions that were invited to his wedding, and he tells the 30 this riddle. He says in verse 11, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. We all know what it is because we just read the story. Now, if you didn't know what just happened, that makes absolutely no sense, and it didn't. So the 30 men were completely, you know, they were mad because there was, uh, Samson said, if you can't get it right, well, then I get 30 changes of clothing, and if you get it right, I'll give you 30 changes of clothing. They, they placed a wager, a bet. For seven days, they could not figure it out, and they started to pester his wife. Well, actually, they, they in a sense, blackmailed his, his wife and said, go entice your husband, get the answer from him, and if you don't do so, we will burn you and your father's house down, right? Now, that sounds like a scary thing, but remember, this is so much, if she actually talked to her husband, 
if they actually had a good relationship, she would have known that this man could tear anyone apart and that she would be completely protected, even from the threat of being burned, right, with her father in her father's house. But she didn't. She fell into that, and she started to, uh, she started to weep in verse 16. She said, you only hate me. You don't love me. Uh, you have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you've not explained it to me. And then he says this horrible thing. He says, look, I've not explained it to my father or my mother, so should I explain it to you? I'm like, what does your mom and dad have to do with this? If you're getting married to her, they're, they're gone. But she wept more, and she says she pressed him so much that he eventually ended up telling her, right? Just completely pestering and pushing him. He's like, fine, I'll, I'll tell you. She then tells the men. And then they come to him with the answer. And Samson gets mad, and this is his response. He says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, which men, don't, I would encourage you, if you didn't know this, don't ever call your wife a heifer. (laughs) You would not have solved my riddle. Says the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 of their men. He took their apparel, and he gave the change of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So he got the 30 pieces of clothing but it ended up costing 30 of the Philistines' lives. It says his anger was aroused and went back to his father's house. Another bad example of what you should do in a marriage, right? (laughs) To to leave your wife and to go to your dad's house and some some time passes. And what what ends up happening, we see in verse 20, is that Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man, right? And I have to explain that. We know that that's not a good thing. So time passes, And Samson's like, okay, maybe that wasn't the best way to handle that, right? Let me go back to her. So in verse 1, it says, After a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat, and he said, let me go into my wife, into her room, but her father would not permit him to uh, to go in. So Samson comes back to either consummate the marriage or to make up with his wife, um, but it probably wasn't a good idea to call her a heifer, and probably not the best idea to bring a goat to, a, to, to make up, right? Her father did not permit him because this is what he thought. He said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And, and what the father is saying is that, well, I have my, her younger sister is actually prettier. Why don't you take her instead? In a sense, almost admitting that Samson was like in the right, that he shouldn't have given away his wife by offering his other daughter. But even though Samson, whether he's right or wrong, it never justifies what he does next. And so in verse three, Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Or in other words, this time I'm justified in doing the Philistines harm or this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. And this is one of Samson's downfalls is that he's constantly wanting revenge, constantly wanting to get even to the point where it utterly destroys him and the people around him. I could have a lot more to say about that, but I think you guys understand the consequences of always trying to want to get even. And you know, God calls us to be different in that sense, to not be vengeful to not to try to get even, right? But rather to to almost do the complete opposite, which is to forgive, but also offer something more, right? Look in Matthew chapter five, verse 38 through 42. I actually have it on the screen. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus speaking, he says, I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And this is, more of an insult, not a physical altercation. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And the point is, is when we do this, we act like God. Because God is the one who did not retaliate. Right? God is the one who did not retaliate against man for his sin, for his rebe- rebellion, but rather he gave his only son to die for us. And so forgiveness is a, an important thing. It's one of the most important things for us as Christians, right? But I think it's one of the hardest things for us to do, for us to implement. Um, you, know, you see it time and time again in our own lives and other people's lives. 
Um, but unforgiveness is, it can become deadly. You know, it, it really can. I would encourage you to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. It's on the screen, but I'm not going to read it. Um, even Romans 12, 19, where, talk, where the Lord talks about vengeance is mine, right? It's, it's not on us to be a vigilante, right? It's not on us to bring about justice. And oftentimes, you know, it's, it's really hard to forgive sometimes, right? Because we have been hurt, we have been pained, you know, we have may, been completely in the right and the other person has been completely in the wrong. But either way, God wants us to forgive. And God never tells us, like, when I, when I ask you to forgive, when I command you to forgive, it's not about being right or wrong, right? It's not about being fair or not fair. It's not about whether the other person deserves it or not, right? Because that's, that's kind of a big one. Like, well, they don't really deserve it. <laughs> well, I mean, again, if you're a born-again Christian, you're trying to follow the commands of God, you know that we did not deserve the forgiveness of God in the first place, right? Even more so than us trying to forgive another sinner, who we ourselves are sinners. And so Jesus paves the way for us to forgive in unforgiving circumstances. And I'll end with this in regards to the forgiveness. A forgiven heart forgives. I think as simple as that, a forgiven heart forgives. So in verse four, it says, Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Remember, he's out for vengeance. And what happens, just like with any siblings, that once you retaliate, the other one retaliates, but even greater, and then it goes back to the other one and retaliates even greater than the previous one to where it just gets to utter destruction. And we're going to see this with Samson, the Philistines. So he went and he caught 300 foxes and he took torches. He turned the foxes tail to tail and he put a torch between each pair of tails. Very similar to Gideon and his 300 who also had torches, right? But Samson here uses foxes or more likely jackals. It's the same Hebrew word ties two together, puts a torch in between, and sets them loose. It says in verse 5, when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines, burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. And this was huge, because this was their entire economy. They had three cash crops, the Philistines. One was wheat, one was olives, and one was grapes, the vineyards. Right? So Samson single-handedly destroys the economic base of this entire nation and more than likely just happening in one night. In verse 6, the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. It's, it's somewhat ironic, right? Because this is what she tried to avoid in the first place. So with his retaliation, Samson hurts himself, right? Hurting the people that is closest to him. So Samson says this, because the Philistines retaliate, and he says, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. Which, if you keep retaliating, you keep trying, you know, uh, to revenge, you can't say it will cease. You can say it, but it probably won't happen. So it says in verse 8 that he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So at the very end of all this, retaliation, 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 Samson's found alone, right? He's found alone, and he retaliates with a crazy and horrendous attack. It says hip and thigh, just speaking of how bad, it's almost in a sense like tearing them from limb to limb, and so here, his revenge, it's, it's always personal. It's never godly. You know, have, have you noticed that? Like, it's always like, this is what has happened to me. This is what I want to do. There's never a righteousness of defending God. It's a very stark contrast to David, right? When David went up against the Philistines as well to fight Goliath, it wasn't about David. David was defending the honor of God. He says, who defies the armies of the living God, Right? He says, I'm going to go defend God's honor. It's not a personal vengeance like it is for Samson. So in verse 9, it says, The Philistines went up and they encamped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson, to do to him as he has done to us. Again, this like middle school 
boys back and forth. Well, he started it, you know, and I'm going to finish it. It says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. They don't even recognize that, like, even in Samson's fault and anger and pride, like, he's, like, defeating their oppressors, right? Like, God's using him to somewhat deliver them from the Philistines, and yet all they're worried about is, like, keeping the peace, right? They, they, they would have rather submit to these rulers, right, who are worshiping false idols and false gods than to actually be dedicated to the one true living God because they would rather be comfortable. They don't want to stand apart. They don't want to disturb the peace. In a sense, they had become friends with the enemy. They say, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? They had given up allegiance to God. They accepted the Philistines rule over them. And so, he goes on in verse 12, but they said to him, we have come down to arrest you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. And so they spoke to him saying, no, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into the, to their hand. I don't know if you guys recognize, they sent 3,000 men to get Samson. <laughs> That's crazy. And then they decide, well, let's just tie him up with two ropes, right? <laughs> well, why do you send 3,000 men? It says they spoke to him saying again, no, but we'll, deli- we'll tie you securely, deliver you into their hand, but we will, not sh- we will surely not kill you. They bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. I mean, like, what were they thinking? So when Samson came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. And you'll see as some of these things happen, as some of these transpire, that there's times where the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and there's other times where the Spirit of the Lord doesn't come upon him. But here we see in verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire. His bonds broke loose from his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He reached out his hand, took it, and killed a thousand men with it. I mean, with, with the most, like, humiliating weapon. A donkey's jawbone. He kills a thousand men alone, right? He's, he's unique compared to every other judge because every other judge led a group of people right? Led armies, but Samson does everything alone. And so this happens, and Samson then praises God. No, no, he doesn't. In verse 16, this is what he does. This is what he says. Comes up with a little jingle, a little song. He says, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. He sings a song to celebrate, but it's all about him, right? Again, in stark contrast to Deborah, one of the first judges that we see in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter five, where in her song, it's much different because she praises God for his help. Where Samson doesn't even recognize that the Holy Spirit comes upon him to accomplish something something this mighty. He's not aware of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so he takes for granted, you know, the power that God gives him for his strength in these endeavors. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi, meaning of the jawbone. And this is what I love in verse 18. He became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and he said, you have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of this uncircumcised? So here's this great man who kills a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone but succumbs to just thirst, right? It's like God's like just completely humbling with something so simple that he's so mighty, but he himself self still needs to, to drink. He needs deliverance from this thirst. And so Samson needed this thirst to remind himself of his own weakness, even after a great victory. And we need to remember who is ultimately in control and worthy of all glory and honor in our victories. Samson didn't know that, or did know that, but didn't do that. It says in verse 19, because God is gracious, God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, he called its name in Hakari, which is in Lehi to this, to this day. So God works a miracle by supplying a spring in response to his cry. And he calls the place the spring of him that called. And it says, and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So again, like we saw at the very beginning, 
that Samson could only begin to deliver them, whereas Jesus comes and he completely delivers us, right? Completely delivers us. He's not delivering us from the Philistines or anyone else. He's delivering us from sin. So again, Samson is a type of Jesus Christ. I want to look at the similarities really quick. Samson was rejected by his own countrymen, right? Was Jesus as well? Yes. Samson was arrested by his own people. Was Jesus as well? Yes. Samson was handed over to certain death as well as Jesus. Samson did not resist his people when they betrayed him. The same with Jesus. He did not open up a word, or he didn't open up his mouth. He didn't say a word. Samson's hands were bound with cords, and Jesus' hands were bound as he went to trial. Samson broke the cords which bound him, and Jesus, in his resurrection, broke the cords of death. And Samson, in his mighty victory, put the army of the Philistines to shame. But Jesus, in his victory, from the resurrection from the dead, defeated Satan, the demons, and all the principalities and powers. He disarmed the, 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 the devil and made a public spectacle of all the demons. Right? Samson, in his victory, delivers his people, and Jesus, in his victory, delivers his people. But there's also a little bit of differences, and I'll end it with this. When the Spirit indwelled Samson, people ended up dead. But Christ, <laughs> empowered by the Spirit, he brings life, right? And Samson was all about himself, whereas Jesus completely gave himself to redeem us. It's a beautiful thing. So as you read through Scripture, it's always important to look at Jesus, to look at God, um, because that is what it all points to. If we try to read ourselves into it, we make mistakes of the context and our understanding of it, our interpretation of it. Um, it's all, it's awesome. I love it. So that's Samson. You guys can go read chapter 16 and see what happens at the end. Um, he somewhat redeems himself in the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, just for the uniqueness of the Old Testament. Lord, that there's so many things that you have written, Lord, for our understanding of, of things that have happened, you have written for our understanding. But Lord, they're so unique, Lord, that you don't expect them to happen again. Lord, that they're not to be imitated, but they're for our understanding, our edification, our growth, a picture of you, of you to come. And Lord, we know that you have come, Lord, that you have died upon the cross, that you have saved us from our sins. And Lord, you have given us a decision to either choose you by putting our faith in you, trusting in you, surrendering to you, or doing what is right in our own eyes. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here tonight who's, who's struggling with that, Lord, who is almost, almost in a sense like Samson, Lord, we know that you can forgive and you can cleanse and you can restore. But Lord, we don't want to be like Samson where we end up alone, hurt, where we affect people with our sin. But Lord, we want, we want to do what you have called us to do. Lord, to lay down our lives. Lord, to follow you. And so I pray that you would do that tonight as, as we cry out to you with our own hearts. I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we go home tomorrow, as we, we hang out with family and friends. Lord, that we could be a good example in our speech, in our conduct, our facial expressions even, no matter what the conversation may bring. Lord, that we would glorify you, that we would honor you, that it wouldn't be about us, but that we would give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord, we're so thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.